Yep, push on. Here we go, like that. Yep, push on. Nice fish. This week on Jetfish, I've hooked on the Wave Runner and I'm heading to the very far northern New Zealand to fish from land and sea. I've been lucky enough to be invited to the local oyster farm to see how that works before being dropped off on a remote inner harbour ledge to fish with top catch bait and burley. The squid is so moist and they love it. I then head out of the harbour on the Wave Runner, switch to Ocean Angle soft baits and continue my far north visit the only way I know how. Here we go, touch up. Fish on! Nice fish! Welcome to Jetfish TV. My name's Kirk Davis and this is episode two of my brand new format of fishing show that I bring to you guys live from right here every week. In tonight's episode, I'm fishing in the very far north of New Zealand. I love it. It's one of my favorite places in the world to fish. It's got beautiful scenery, beautiful fishing and beautiful people. And tonight, I'm lucky enough to meet with some of those people up there who take me to the oyster farm in the harbour and show me how that works. Speaking of people, tonight on the couch I've got the infamous Mr Bill Hohepper. He's come to chat some lyrics and give away some prizes with me. So talking about prizes, why don't we give something away now? Let's give away uh, some 20 pound Daiwa J thread, which is fluorocarbon, and some Ocean Angler soft baits. All you need to do to get in to win them, is tag a mate and tell them Billy Ho is on the show. So get tagging now. While you do that, I'm going to have a chat to me mate. Billy Ho, how are you? I'm very well. Thanks Ian. Thanks welcome. for inviting me. That was wonderful. Yeah, welcome. So Bill and I were having a bit of a chat before the show and he's, he's telling me a couple of old stories about um, old fishing stories and I'm sure he'll have some of them to, to talk to you guys about tonight. So you can ask questions as we go. Uh, yeah, anything you want, really, anything you want to ask Bill, anything you want to ask me. Um, yeah, what, what have you been up to, Bill? It's been a while since you were a fisherman on TV, I have to say. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I only got out of it because everybody and his dog was starting to you know, get into the TV show. So I decided, well, I have another passion, and, uh, and that's you know, old machinery, old trucks, cars, and things like that. So I went down the road of, of making a TV show about, about that. And it's more of a, a nostalgia show for people my age, <laughs> up to about 50 I suppose, but looking back at the old days when uh, when we were building New Zealand and, and the machines and the people and what they did and how they did it and where they did it, so it's it's been very successful, yes. Good, yeah I mean I have to say um, having Bill on the couch here with me tonight is pretty special for me. When I was growing up it was Bill who I was watching on TV and I remember going out, rowing my little dinghy out. I, we went used to go to Martins Bay every year over Christmas and I used to row my little dinghy out every morning and pretend I was Billy Ho or Bill Ho Hipper and I'd park up by the ski boys and I'd be happy if I was catching a jack mackerel or a, a little snapper to throw back or anything, you know, and it, I just I just loved it. And so it's it's great for me to have you here tonight. So Excellent. Thanks for coming. Back in the old days, I used to row a dinghy as well, but I, I put it in a Kawa Kawa Bay and row across to Pānui, which is probably about two miles, I think it was, mm -hmm. then stash the dinghy in the flax and go and go walk about around Pānui Island over the weekend. So I had a a pack of spuds, mm -hmm. a little cooker, yep, and uh, and if I didn't catch a fish, I just had spuds. But it wasn't very often that I didn't catch a fish. But and then come back on Sunday, row the whole lot back again, and go home. Yeah, but great adventure. An adventure is what this show is all about. So in tonight's episode, when we get to it, we're not there quite there yet. We're going to give that prize away first. But you'll see that I use the ski to get to a little place, like Bill's just talked about on Ponoi, and I get to a little place where I couldn't take a boat, park it up, and I fish off the shore. I love going on a little adventure where you fish somewhere different, you do some different type of fishing. And in tonight's show, it's fishing with bait, and it's fishing with a soft bait. So two halves to the show. Bait in the harbour, soft baits out of the harbour. 
great. I, I just love that type of fishing. So let's have a look how we are getting on with everybody tagging some people. So um, Blake, if you can scroll back just a couple. Let's just scroll back there. Let's have a look there. Let's pick one. And let's go for um, Ben Crawford, shall we? So there we go. Ben Crawford, if you can send uh, me a message on the Jetfish TV page, so you've got to all like Jetfish TV to be in the draw for these big prizes. But uh, Ben, if you can send me a message on the Jetfish TV page, and I will send you some Daiwa uh, 20 pound fluorocarbon or J thread and some Ocean Angler soft baits during the week. So talking of prizes, let's just have a, a reminder quickly of the prizes we've got. So every week we give away some prizes. We've got hats, we've got Ocean Angler soft baits, we've got braid, we've got fluorocarbon, the J braid, the J thread from Daiwa. We've got uh, one Daiwa t-shirt left and we've got a pair of pliers. You're going to possibly see this pair of pliers in action tonight actually. It's a real nice little, little set of pliers with some awesome cutters on because we're going to be doing some, some knots and some lines after the show. That's the weekly giveaways and that's what we've already given some of that away tonight. So you've just got to keep listening, keep tagging, keep watching, be there. And then the major prize for the season is we've got a Daiwa KIX 3000 soft bait reel. We've got 300 metres of braid. We have got a um, TD Black Macker, Daiwa TD Black Macker soft bait rod, 7 foot soft bait rod. We've got a Lawrence Hook 7 split shot. We've got two Yamaha Life Vests, we've got two Yamaha Caps, and we've got a Yamaha Grab Bag to carry all that booty in, and all of that can be used when you come on. You and a mate get to come out for the day on your own jet ski. We're going to provide you both with a jet ski for the day. You don't get to keep it, but you do get, if you make your own way to Auckland, we'll get the ski all set up for you. You can go fishing on it. You can, I'll be there on my ski. We'll go looking for dolphins. We will go fishing. We will just go cruising the islands whatever it is you want to do. But to be in the draw for that major prize, you've got to make sure you tag a mate during the show on this show, and you've got to make sure that you like Jetfish TV on Facebook. If you want to double up your options to win, like Jetfish TV on Instagram as well. So Jetfish TV on Facebook, Jetfish TV on Instagram, and tag someone during the show. You can tag as many people as you want. Every time you tag someone, you get another entry. So, talking about tonight's episode... Um, it's the far north. I love the far north, and you'll see why. Um, we're going to head there shortly. We've split the show into two halves. So the first half is in the harbour. We'll come back out at half time. If you've got any questions about the show, you can ask them then. You can ask me. You can ask Bill. Obviously, um, two different styles of fishing, and a little bit of what I call old school versus new school. And so, pretty good, pretty good mix, I think, of of. Uh, let's call it talent on the couch to, to answer any questions that you guys might have. So how about without any further delay, we get into part one of Jetfish TV. Welcome to Jetfish. My name's Kirk Davis and this is my show where I take you to meet some pretty cool people in some pretty cool places and have some pretty cool fishing experiences. And I do it all on a wave runner. With a range of over 150 kilometres, I can go anywhere that a boat can go. It's easy to launch, safe and stable enough to stand on one side or fight large fish. I've got all the electronics and storage that any boat would have, and I always carry with me the latest safety equipment. This life's not going to live itself. So hop on now, and let's head off on today's Jetfish Adventure. This week on Jetfish, I've hooked on the Wave Runner and I'm heading to the very far north of New Zealand to fish from land and sea. I see the far north as my spiritual home. I love the place, the fishing it offers and the people I've met there over the years. Today, I've been lucky enough to be invited to Walter, Wayne and Nutana's office to check out the local oyster fishery before heading out and getting stuck into some fishing.
Haringaringa Harbour is a massive harbour in the far north of New Zealand. The population around it is pretty small, but fortunately for that population, or for some of them, there's a big oyster farm here. And that oyster farm is a great sustainable way, one, of growing oysters, and two, of giving those people some employment. One of the cool things about this oyster farm is they give the kids in the local schools, the older kids, 5,000 dozen oysters, so that's 60,000 oysters as little babies, and they get to learn how to cultivate them, grow them, right through to the big oysters when they can sell them. That is a great way to give kids a learning of how to work in business, a great way to give them an understanding of the environment they live in, as well as make a little bit of money along the way. So let's have a look now at how these oysters' life cycle works, where they go from small to big, how they grow them, before we go and get into some fishing. I've pulled alongside the oyster barge and I'm going to have a little chat to Walter. Now it's amazing, talking to these guys, how quickly these oysters grow. So Walter, what size were they when you got them as spat? Um, five to six mil. That was two months ago. Yeah. They were five mils long and now they are about 50, 50, 50 to 70. Yeah. Yep. So that is an amazing growth. And it just goes to show how, how I guess, it, it seems to me to be quite sustainable in here. It, it's not like, I'm not a big fan of commercial fishing, um, where you go out and scoop all the fish up, but something that's sustainable where you're constantly putting back and constantly growing to provide a market seems like a no-brainer to me. With the work done for the morning, the boy showed me a great spot that I could only get to by jet ski. There's no way you'd get to shallow water like this in a boat. That's why I love my wave runner. Oh yeah, first bait in the water. New spot, never fished this one before, but it looks fishy. Bit of shade at the moment, little bit of a drop off. Plenty of fish activity, plenty of shags. I love fishing a spot where there are lots of shags at because it means there's lots of bait. And we pulled in here, we had bait swimming around in here, we had an octopus walking around. So that to me says, yeah boy. Tide's still very low, I would expect this spot will get better as the tide comes in. We're only about an hour after low tide at the minute. So we'll just be patient, we've got the burly running out the back of the ski, chunking throwing the odd chunks out, little pilchard chunks that I got from Top Catch, just chucking them out, just keep the, keep the flow going, keep the feed going, keep the interest going in those fish that are coming into this shallow harbour as the tide comes in. Oh. I was just retrieving my bait and something's grabbed it, I'm hoping it's a little kahawai because it will be a great live bait. Oh, it's a little snapper. Huh. Look at them all lit up. Look at those beautiful colours. Right, here he comes. Nice little panny. Just hooked through the lip, so We'll unhook him, have a little look at him, and we'll send him back on his way. Yeah, mate, hook out. Just let him go. Off you go, little fella. Away he goes. Nice. What a start to what's so far been a pretty cool morning and what I think is going to be a pretty epic day. whole pilchard on this time rather than a half. That half might have just been enticing the little ones to have a bit of a friendly chew. So we'll put a whole one on and see if that makes a difference. Sometimes it actually makes a huge difference. Like they may not even bite it at all. And then you put a fillet on, just a little half fillet from a pilchard and you can get some really nice snapper. It just depends how they're feeding. So you've got to just mix it up a bit see what works for you, see what doesn't work, and then go from there really. Yeah, push on. Where are 
Jersey. Oh, he's over the edge of the ledge. This guy is surrounded by Kahawai. He's just cruising real hard little fighter. He's not a monster snapper. But because we're so shallow and we've got that big ledge there, real hard little horizontal fight. Let's have a look at him. It's nicely lip hooked, he's got plenty of energy. And there he is. Not a bad one, and I think he might be dinner. Okay, straight back out there. When there's a hot bite like this, click it straight into gear and keep in touch with it. There we go, another little touch there straight away. Another touch, another touch. Voracious feeding. This squid, so moist, and they love it. And it looks like it's bite time. Get him up over the edge. It's close to the edge now. Oh, I can feel him on the edge. Let's have a look at him. He's a nice size. Stay him down there. You can see how hungry they are. He's just engulfed that bait. Both hooks, you know when both hooks were set in their mouth, that these fish are hungry. Let's set them loose and we'll set them free. Yep, settle down. Turn around that way and off you go. Well, not that way yet. There you go. You're away. I'm going to put this tiny little piece that was left over from the last fish I caught but it's a bite-sized piece, so I'm going to cast it out, keep in touch with my line, and see how we go. Oh. That's not a bad one. On to one. This one feels not too bad. Real feisty, at least. I'm going to have to get towards the edge. Oh, here he comes. And he's not even that big. But he just fought so hard when he grabbed it. He won't, he'll be fine. Ooh. So much power, so much horizontal power in the shallow. That's a beautiful fish. not a bad one. He is just hooked. Look at that, he's just hooked through the lip. Nice fish. These fish are hitting the bait very close to the surface, just a few seconds after the bait hits the water, so I'm having to be really onto it. It's almost like a pack of piranhas. I'm going to cast it out and we'll see how long it takes to get hit. On. Another feisty one. Man, this spot is great for some feisty little panties. You can see how abundant the fish life is here as a large ray swims right at me. She's old Ray wants him, I think. Another nice panny. We're going to have to keep this one because he's hooked deep. He won't go to waste. We'll put him on ice. Don't worry, it's not finished. We're just at the half time break. Why don't we give away some prizes? And if you guys have got any questions, you can ask them now briefly before we get back into part two. 
Okay, why don't we give away some Ocean Angler soft baits and uh, some Farnley's Yamaha hats. Now, to win this one, what I want to know is how many people are watching your device and what is it? So, for example, if it's just you watching on your phone, just say one on my phone. If two of you are watching, two on my phone. If it's if you're watching on an, an iPad, you know, two on my iPad or three people with with streamed it to the TV, just let me know how you're doing that. And all those people will go into the draw for those Ocean Angler soft baits and some family hats, and we'll give you a hat for each person that's watching. How I saw a question come through during the um, during the the clips asking what rod it is that I use. So what I use is a Daiwa Hyper. So it's you would have seen it's the green rod, two piece rod, and I pair that. I've got a couple of them. I pair it with a BG three thousand, which I love, a little BG three thousand soft bait reel or the Saltus Nero 3000, and that's also an awesome reel. Both pretty good reels and very hardy. They have to be hardy to go on the ski, because it, it does get wet if you don't cover them. Uh, Bill, what did you think of, of that session? Bring back any memories? Oh, absolutely. I, I absolutely love the, the, the far north, and, uh, and we never had a ski. We just had to walk through the mangroves and the what have you to get out of the places that you got to. But we caught some magnificent fish. And then we, we, we graduated to 10-foot um, fire antennas and a little, a little 10 horse outboard. Mm -hmm. And that got us around a bit further around that harbour, way up into the harbour, you know, up yeah. towards um, Kaio and places like that, up those little gaps and fishing in amongst the mangroves and, and some monster fish. It was just amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in that little harbour session, you would have seen we didn't get many monster fish, but some great panties. I actually chose to release almost all of them. And you'll notice that it's a theme during my the whole season of jet fishes, I if I can release them in shallow water like that, I'll release them. Almost all the fish that you'll see today were released to swim another day. A couple that we had to keep, we kept for dinner. But I'm all about preserving the, the fishery. No, we've been up there a few times. I took a camp ho heifer up there once. There was 24 kids and, and we were fished off that wharf. Just about all of us got on that wharf catching piper and, and yellowtail. Mm -hmm. And one of the kids sort of put a, just put a hook into a pipe, a chuck it, and all whang! Yep. Just took him about an hour and a half to yeah. get this kingfish in. It was just an absolute horse. Yeah, that last time I was there, I looked at that wolf. It was closed. It was almost oh, demolished yeah, now. It was, yeah, it was in pretty condition, better condition in the in the nineteen seventies. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and now it's uh, it's not running smooth. Okay, so why don't we have a look and we'll just scroll through and pick. A winner of the soft baits and the hats. So let's pick one out of there, Blake. How about we go Wayne Robbins? So Wayne has got two people casting for TV. So Wayne, if you can flick a message to Jetfish TV um, with your contact details, and I will get to you some Ocean Angler soft baits and a couple of uh, Yamaha Farley's Yamaha hats. Okay. So um, after this next little session. We are going to come back and we're going to look at some things, uh, some questions that you guys asked last week. So last week you guys asked, you wanted to see some knots. That was some feedback we got if, if you wanted to see some knots. So I'll show you some knots on how I deal with it for soft baiting, just a basic uni knot, back-to-back -back uni knot. And then um, if you've got any questions for Bill on how he does his knots for his different rigs, or I can show you the knots that I use for rigs when I'm, when I'm using fresh bait like we just used. But for now... Keep tagging some mates if you think they should be watching. But we're going to get into the second half of Jetfish TV. This week on Jetfish, I've taken the Wave Runner to the far north of New Zealand and used it to access spots that no boat could get to. After a good night's sleep, it's time to bid the locals farewell and head wide in search of the big one. When the tide is low like this, it's very easy to take the trailer off the car and launch the ski by hand. Right, I've got a couple of hours free before I have to head back south towards home. The cameraman's gone. So I'm out here on the Wave Runner on my own. And I'm going to head out of the harbour and up the coast just a touch. Somewhere between here and North Cape. And I'm going to be looking for bombies. And I'm just going to cast some soft baits into those bombies and see if we can't upsize the snapper. Let's go. Now 
Now I'm out of the harbour, I've switched to a soft bait. No more smelly baits or fresh baits, but a seven inch bruised banana. I'm using a quarter ounce jig head. The reason it's only a quarter ounce is because I'm fishing shallow. It's only between about eight and 14 metres deep and this will just sink down nice and slowly and that's what I want it to do. These snapper are going to hear this bait hit the water and they're going to come up off the bottom to get it. This water is so crystal clear, they see everything that moves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cast it well ahead. There's a whole patch of bombies this way and that's the way I'm drifting. And those bombies are really just bits of very low-lying fowl and weed, not even really rocks, mostly just weed. And you can see it when the sun's out through the polarised glasses, you see the dark patches in the water. So that's what I'm aiming for, is those little dark patches. And just casting that bait, letting it slowly sink down, and then just keeping that soft bait slowly moving, just enough to get the interest of those big mooching snappers down there. Oh, inquiry, oh, little inquiry, but you never know. The weird thing in here sometimes, soft baiting is, that the smallest inquiry can be a really big snapper. It can start off with a real small little dip, 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 and then bam, fish on. Something's inquiring here, I think it, here we go, like that. Real soft and quarry, and that's a good fish. Oh, <laughs> dropped it. Okay. Oh, oh, here we go. Oh. Might be back. Let's just see. Something's there. Something's there, here we go. Yeah. For sure. Oh, that's a good fish. Did you see the speed he took off there? The power was incredible. I'm only using six kilo line, six kilo braid, but man, he took off. Right, let's get him in. It's a nice one. Here he comes. I might be able to lift him in by the soft bait. There he is. And let's have a look at him. I'm going to let him go. So I'm not going to stick my hands in his gills. There he is. He's devoured that soft bait right down his gob. Perfectly hooked. He's not getting off. And man, what a first run. What an initial run this guy had. For his size, he's only about a six pound snapper, about three kilos. And what a run, man. Jeez, let's get this hook out. We'll let him go. Go, soft baits out. Put that down there. And we're Off he goes. Beautiful. Let's see if we can get a bigger one. Fish on. Not sure what this is. Doesn't feel like a snapper. Yeah. Nice colour, nice pull. It's just a nice size snapper on the atomic sunrise this time. Oh, yep. Good shot. Is it a little one or is he running at me? How's that for a different species? Nice trevally around the 45 centimetre mark. It'd be beautiful sashimi, but I'm going to let him go. Hook the hooks out. I'm going to let him go and he can swim off. Shit's about to get real.
here we go. Touch up. Press on. Nice fish. This fish wasn't going to come quietly. In fact, it looked like I was going to have to chase him down. This is a good fish. If it's a snapper, it is an absolute monster of a fish. Just started up there just to get a bit closer to it. Because if this is a snapper, it is a big one. Just kept casting, kept casting. Nothing for ages, nothing for ages, and I just kept working, working these bombies. Casting the edge, casting the middle. And hooked onto something nice here, man. It was a real light bite. Probably saw it, it was just like a little touch. And as soon as I pricked that hook in it, that's when it took off. Headed a bit out to sea, but it's still over these bombies. We're in 14 metres of water, and it's kind of just holding its ground now. It's a snapper. I can see it. Man, he took off fast. He felt way bigger than he is. But man, this is a nice fish. Beauty. How's that for a monster snapper? Caught on the seven inch bruised banana. I've headed out, out of the harbour, up the coast just a little bit. And this guy's probably 16, 17 pounds. What a cracker. That was episode two. Man, I love it up there. The fishing is so awesome. Hope you guys enjoyed it as well. So what we'll do now is, why don't we give away another prize? Let's give away a Farnley's hat and a Yamaha drink bottle. And um, what we'll do is to get in this draw for this lot of prizes, ask us a question. You can ask Bill a question. You can ask me a question. Ask me something about the show. Anything you want. I saw somebody ask during the... Um, during the show what jig heads I use and if we switch to the top cam top catch gear cam Blake we'll have a little look so that is the that's the jig head that I use that is a, um, a light bulb jig head from Ocean Angler that's uh, about a half ounce this one a little half ounce and uh, yeah beautiful so um, questions. Let's have a look at what questions we've got. Um, so that's a good one, actually. Do I leave my Yamaha Wave Runner running when I'm fishing? And Terry's asked that question. Uh, sometimes is the answer for that, Terry. Um, if I'm fishing somewhere that I need to hold a position or something like that, particularly like in a um, mussel farm where I'm holding between a barge and a, and a line or something like that, then I'll leave it running and I can just, I can specifically be anywhere I want to. But when I'm fishing in a situation like you just saw me then, I'll just shut down and turn off. I'll work out where I want to drift to. It was about 12 meters deep there. I'll, I'll shut down, work out where I want to drift to and just drift through. I like to be nice and quiet and when I'm fishing that type of fishing. So I shut down, cast ahead into those bombies, boom, on like your nana. 
I um I used to think that being quiet was was the was the secret, but I've got a mate that's got a very big boat and he's got the GPS anchoring system, so the engine is going the whole time. Yep. You sit the boat and it just stays there, but out the back of this jet unit is just bubbles and noise and yep. Anyway, chuck a bait out, wang, snap it, wang, everything, and, and it, didn't, it just blew me away. All this noise, all these bubbles. So I think it's the, the bubbles that were, uh, you know, sort of attracting the, the fish because if you chuck a bait into a, a big wash, you know, it's going up the side of a rock. You, for some reason, that white water produces good fish as well. So what this boat was doing was producing white water, and up came the fish. But that just blew me away. You know, I said, wow, all this noise, and, and, and it's working. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's actually quite surprising. If I'm if I'm fishing um, a wash, then I'll often keep my engine running, depending on which way the wind's going and the swell's running. But just when I when I can do a nice quiet little drift through, um, I'll shut down. It's just very easy to shut down. And what it allows you to do on a ski is you can point the rod, and that will turn the ski. So even the, even a small little snapper, a forty centimeter snapper, will turn the ski. If I want to turn the ski that way, I can just move the rod. It'll pull the ski that way. I'll move it this way. It'll pull the ski Good around. God. Really? It's 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 amazing how manoeuvrable yeah. it is. See. Uh, so, what is my favourite type of fishing bait? Uh, Cameron's asked that. What's my favourite type of fishing? Um, uh, he's asking you that, Bill. Do you prefer oh, okay. baits or well, lures? Well, uh, back in the olden days, it was all bait, and um, lures didn't really come till about the sort of. Oh, in 2004, five, six thereabouts. But my my bait is is in the summertime. I go catching mullet, and and fresh mullet is the bait for the for the snapper during the summertime. And in the winter time, I, I just like to sort of net a beach. So we've got sprats or yellowtail or piper. And so if I'm going somewhere like uh, any bay really up north, south, east or west, I'll go and find a nice beach, net it that morning. And that's the bait that I'd use for for that day. So you, you didn't buy bait. What you got from the from the bait shots was a, a, a box of trevally, like so. And sometimes I just chop the box in half, put the whole thing on for for a bait for or a you, big moocher or, or a squid. So you, you, yeah, it's, buying bait was just horrible. That so, was back in the days though, when we anyone could go out and just catch a big moocher like this. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this, in those days, as I say, you just caught your own but what I found was fresh mullet in the summer just 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 was awesome and you know you just sort of chop it off behind the girls stick the whole head on and, and fire that in and you've got the monster snapper beautiful right a couple more questions uh, I saw one about is it worth burlying in the harbour uh, when the when the tide is really running and that's a good question because the like that question is based on does the burly all get sucked away or does it draw them in? And I'm, I'm still a fan of burleying any time, regardless of the current, because it will bring them up to look for that source. The fish will naturally be kind of looking for that source, and it'll bring them into the area. And if you're casting baits out, your baits are going to get pulled along in that current as well to go with the burley. So I would I would cast my bait to where that burley's going. I, uh, my burley, I have a, a, a big pot at the bottom, Chunks of pilchard, so mm -hmm. it's sort of chop up a two two ice cream containers full of mm -hmm. and put them in, and so you've got these big chunks of, of, of burley going out along the bottom, and on the top, I'd have the uh, have the small grainy mm -hmm. burley. So all the bait fish will start coming along and eating on that. Mm -hmm. That the fish go, oh, there's the bait fish. So underneath the bait fish, there must be some, there must be bits of the other, you know, the predators are all eating. So yes, that's right. So everything's right. right. <laughs> and of course, you've got your um, bit of a bait down there with a hook in it. Yep, so just floating you, through the burly yep, trail. So you've just got everything all, all as it should be, you know. So the, the the top ones, the bait fish feeding on the smaller fish, and on the bottom is the bits and pieces of those bait fish being eaten. Mm -hmm. So it's all about thinking like a fish, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have a look. What else we got? Seen any good ones in there, Blake? Uh, have I been caught out from nasty weather? And had to push the ski back to its limit to get back to shore. That's a good question because uh, I am very big on safety. And in next week's show, I do a little piece on safety and about the safety equipment that I have with my PFD and my PLB and my radio and my phone and all that type of stuff. So typically, no, I've never been caught out in really bad weather. But I have been out in situations where it's gotten worse than I would like it to be. But the beauty of the Wave Runner is it's, it's so stable. I would rather be on, 
a wave runner to get home in the rough than I would be to be in a, a four meter boat, for example. The, the, the ski is only three meters long, uh, but it's, it's way more stable. You're not gonna get swamped. You know, I can stand on one side, I can take a leak if I want to standing there, do whatever you want, you know, fight large fish. But I, I've never felt unsafe coming back in, in bad weather. Um, what else have we got here? Um, yeah, hang on, go down. So Ryan, so Evan, Evan says he's got a question for Bill. What's your biggest snapper that you've caught? Uh, 36 pound. 36 pound, that's a bloody We, we caught that at Spirits Bay. <clears throat> we were, we were, I was fishing for Kahawa. And um, we put the, I caught a kaha about so big, which I stuck out for a kingy, which is what you do at Hooper's Point back in the day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> anyway, the balloon went down and away it goes, and I've got this kingy. <laughs> and, and playing away there, and I said, Jesus, this doesn't feel right. You know, this yep. isn't wrong with it. It's a bit of a limp, this, this kingy. Yep. But anyway, it's coming back, coming and coming, and then it's just this big red. And I said, oh, yeah. God, look at the size of that. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, lucky enough, it just sort of washed into the rock and over into a puddle, and, and there he was. So we just took a photograph of him, weighed him, and then um, and then put him back in the water. Nice. Yeah. Did you measure him? Yeah. You know, you know no, I didn't. No, no idea. But interesting to know how long a fish that size yeah, must be yeah. like pushing him. And meter. I've got a mate in Norfolk Island. If you want to catch huge snapper, go to Norfolk Island. There's a bloke up there called Dave Big, not hard to find, but 26 miles southwest of Norfolk Island is where the big snapper live. And the smallest one he's ever caught is 16 pounds. The biggest he's caught was 42, 41, a 39, and a 38, all in the Jesus. same day. Massive fish. I mean, he's you know five foot eight, and this big fish he's holding is as big as he is. Massive things. And they're the same fish that we get in New Zealand. Amazing. Mm. Bradley's asking, I'm pretty sure he's asking you this question because I've seen a photo on your Facebook page. What's the best brand of ute canopy to fish out of in 2020? <laughs> I don't think they make crown canopies anymore. <laughs> no, that was a, an absolute hoot because the, the guy um, who owned the company said, if you can come up with an idea that's as good as the man jumping off the bridge and bungeeing and catching a trout, I'll sponsor your, I'll sponsor your, um, I'll sponsor your ladies' fishing adventure which, by the way, is up on YouTube, Bill O'Hepper YouTube, Ladies Fishing Adventure, it's great. And uh, I said, well, I've got an idea. I said, can you put one of those things in the water and does it float? He said, hang on, what? He said, just, just shut the door, put it in some water and does it float? Yes, it does. Right, I've got an idea. We'll take it up to the beach, we'll put a little outboard motor on the back of it, I'll check out, catch some fish and come on back again. And, and that's, <laughs> that's what we did. But it was a, a, an absolute hoot, yeah. Okay, so a couple more questions. Dave says, do I burly when I'm drifting with soft baits? And the answer is typically no, although I was out with Dave the other day and oh, this the same guy who's asked this question, yeah. I'm picking that's why he's asked the question. Um, I'm not going to answer his question he asked before about the couch, but um, he had a bucket of mussel shells and we were drifting, there was quite a current and we were drifting and we weren't catching bugger all, it was a real slow day, full moon. And so I, I said, oh, I'm going to start burling. We're in, I think we we're in 40 metres of water, something like that. And I just started chucking these mussel shells over, just really because I was bored and there was nothing else happening. And after about 10 minutes, Dave caught a snapper and it came up and he said, oh, look, it's got a bit of squid hanging out of its mouth. And I grabbed it, pulled it out, and it was a bit of mussel wow. that I'd just been yeah. chucking over. And so typically, no, you don't burly when you're soft baiting unless it's all turned to shit and then... You chuck over whatever you've got, obviously. It's a story like that. We were fishing in a bay over in um, uh, Tapu, Motor Tapu. Uh -huh. And uh, we were having chicken for lunch, uh, and yes. we were all just chucking lumps of chicken over. Yep. Anyway, we, we had these uh, people from overseas, and we went to Ginger's place at uh, uh, the Swashbucklers in town, and he, he cooked the snapper especially. And when he came out with it, it was all lovely, well done, well cooked. He said, well, Bill, I was going to be smart and tell you we tell you where you caught it, but you blew me away, this thing is full of bloody chickens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, let's give away that prize because we've had a heap of questions that have been asked. So, Blake, if you can just scroll down, and I'll, I'll go through and I'll answer these questions just in there somewhere. Let's have a look. Um, let's pick a question and we'll answer it. How about we give it to... 
to Ross because we answered his question. So Ross Crape, since we're there, about when fishing in the harbour, is it worthwhile burling? So we answered that question. Ross, if you can send me a message on Jetfish TV Facebook page. Uh, and we will get that prize to you. So what we'll do now is some people wanted to see um, how I tie my uni knot. So we will go to the Jetfish, uh, the top catch um, gear cam, and I'll grab a piece of rope. So there's our light bulb jig head. I'm going to use just some orange braid here to uh, be pretend fluorocarbon, just so that you can see it nice and easy. So all I do to tie my jig head on is it goes through the eye, do a little loop like that, so just a little nice little loop, hold it like that, and then wrap it through there three times. And you should be able to do this in about, you know, five or ten seconds if you're sitting there, even on a ski when it's choppy. Pull that tight there, pull it up tight, and then get your pliers and snip it off nice and tidy. And so that is a uni knot. That's how I do all my jig connections on a jig. Now, to do a um, leader, we put that there. I'll show you how I now connect my leader, my leader to my main line. So I've got a blue line. Let's call that my main line, right? So that's my braid. We've got that there. Let me just lay that out. And the orange is my fluorocarbon. So what we're going to do and how I tie my two together is just with a back-to-back -back uni. So hold the two of them together, do a little loop, just like we did before. Hold it like this and go through there. When I do a back-to-back, -back, I go through four times. So one, two, three, four, and then pull that up but not too tight. So I've just pulled it so it's tightish. That's a technical term, tightish. And then again with the other line, so the orange is now my fluorocarbon. I go through there. One, two, three, four times. Pull that up tightish. And so now you can see I've got two knots, right? So I've got one at that end and one at that end, and I just pull it together and it tightens up. So now, just with the clippers, quickly tidy that up like that, and this one up like that, and that is your finished knot. Nice and tidy. Easily castable trace to or your fluorocarbon trace to your main line. So um, we'll come back to the main camera, that's good. And have you guys got any questions? Do you want to see how um, how Bill does any specific knots for baiting? We could we can show you how we, we hook the sinkers up. Like the, the, the one I use in the harbour is actually a really interesting knot. It's a little bit tricky. It involves a couple of swivels and it holds the sinker where it is. But if you've got any questions about to, to Bill or you want to ask him about what sort of rigs he, <coughs> he has, go right ahead. Or Bill, you want to I, tell I, us? I, I, <coughs> I've got a ball sink in here, I suppose that'll do. But is there a, um, a, a piece of paper? Or? What I can do is I can show you. I can I can film it if you want me to. Oh, no, I just do? need a piece of paper. Just I have that. You got one? Yep. So if I roll this up, yep. imagine that's the fish, and so if I'm harbour fishing, or even deep water fishing, what I have is a, a, a ball sinker, and um, so the, the line goes through the middle, the main hook goes through the middle, <coughs> and then I hook it into the gill and out the eyeball, pull it tight, and then I bring down this ball sinker and stick it on the side of the sinker, of the bait, do a couple of half hitches, and so the, the, the sinker is part of the bait. So when it floats down, and that's all I really do. I don't really sort of use the 
floating around all over the place. I just put the, the depending on how deep it is, how big that sinker is. But most of the time, it's about as big as my little fingernail there on a you know, on a fish that size. But mm-hmm. it just takes it down nice and slow. Just keep feeding it, keep feeding it, keep feeding it. It'll get down even if the current's sort of quite strong. It'll get down there, and uh, wang, away you go. So uh, that's that's pretty much what I used all the time back in the back. In, well, still do. Cool. Yeah. Okay, a couple of questions. So, uh, do we normally wet the knots before we pull it together? Yes. If I'm going braid to um, braid to fluorocarbon, yes, I will typically wet it and then just ease it together. That for that scenario, I didn't need to do it. Obviously, I wasn't too concerned. But yeah, out in the field, I'd I'd wet it. Um, Andrew has asked about a live bait rig. Next week, Andrew, you will see how I do my live bait rig. We go live baiting in the harbour um, for kingfish, so we will see that. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, Bill, do you soft bait much or mainly use bait? Oh no, I so I do whatever is required. So if you're not getting any fish on bait, the soft baits are you know, if it's not by time, they're, they're curious, and so you've got this little soft bait. And you're jigging the thing, and it's jumping all over the place. They'll mm-hmm. come. Oh, what's that? Oh, I wonder if I can eat it. <laughs> yep. But when it's time to eat. That's what they do. They eat. So, uh, so if that's the time for the um, for bait. Yeah. So then, then there's lures. You know, the, the jigs themselves. The slider type lures yeah. and the, the or, jitterbugs. And, yes, yep. that's yep. right. So the, the you know the, the lures are endless. Yeah. I don't know if they're to catch fish or catch fish and men, but but anyway, I've got a mate that it's Captain Asparagus and Matter Matter, and he's got a wall full of lures. So I think it's more catching him than that's <laughs> true. catching fish. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, what I, the way I look at it is for for lures and jigs and soft baits, is that fish have got no hands, right? So if we're out and about and we see something float down out of the sky and hit the ground, we're going to have a look at it. We might go and pick it up. Fish can't do that. Fish are going to come up and they're going to use their mouth to yes. have a little try and see what it is that that thing is, right? That's their hands, and that's how sometimes you hook them. That's why sometimes you hook them in the in the um, in the eye, in the in the face, in the ass, even it just depends how they're how they're playing with the bait. Yep, I uh, uh, Par Farm used to have a snapper hatchery, and to go and watch some of the bigger fish. They they'd suck something in, and then for no reason, out it goes yes. again. You yep. know. Yep. And if you weren't paying attention at that particular time, you'd go, oh, gone. And that's why rule number one of soft baiting is always keep in touch with your line because often they'll come in. They'll mouth it to see just what it is, and if they don't like it, they'll just spit it out. But if you feel them mouth it, bang, fish yeah. on. Yeah. Yep, and you, you've got them. Michael asks, um, what's you saying about shags and haircuts? Oh, yes. <laughs> when I was sort of teaching the kids at Camp Ho have a see those shags sitting, all the shags in the water there? Well, they're not there for a haircut. They're there to eat. Exactly. And the thing about seabirds, with the exception of seagulls, they all have to eat fish, and um, and, and that's the bite time thing. So if the birds aren't doing anything, they're all just sitting, floating, whatever, the fish pretty much aren't doing anything either. But once the gannets start diving and the sooty start going and everything's all starting to go, you, the, the fish are the same. They're all getting stuck into uh, into dinner. So when it's not bite time, they're all just swimming around, sort of getting on with each other, and all of a sudden they become vicious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's tea time. Yeah, that's all go. So let's speaking of, of birds and bite times, let's go to the map now. We'll have a little look at where the fish are because we're coming into workup season. So I'll talk to you a little bit about a workups and how they come into the harbour. So if you think about the Haraki Gulf or the Firth, right, all the fish come into here, all the bait fish come into here, the snapper come in here after them, the kingfish and the um, kawai and the dolphins and the whales. And it's from about this time of year that that starts happening. And to find them, you've got to think like a fish. And you've got to think, well, how are they going to get in there? And there's only three points they can get in. There's this channel here which is the Jellicoe channel. There's this channel here, which is the Craddock channel. And then there's this one, which is the Colville channel. Those are the only three ways that all that bait can flood into the harbour. So if you think about it, that's really concentrating a huge amount of fish. So they start about now, or even a little bit earlier, they'll start up north 
and start making their way down south. And if you were further out, you'd probably see some as well. And about now, they're probably starting to come through this Craddock Channel. The Craddock Channel can be an awesome place for fishing workups at this time of year. You'll get the, the gannets and the whales and the dolphins because what happens is you've got the currents coming in here and the fish coming in here, migrating in through here, all the baits, and you've got also a whole lot coming in through this Colville Channel. And what happens is the currents get pushed up there, gets pushed up there, and you get a whole lot of fish getting pushed against the side of the barrier, especially early on in workup season. So that's where they, they start and then they make their way and probably in about uh, over the next four weeks, they'll start making their way closer into here and around uh, top of Coromandel, Flat Rock area. And then they make their way slowly down into these areas, in towards Turi, and they end up coming down here, so they come down the Coromandel uh, side, all in these bays, they get pushed in by the predators and the dolphins and the whales, this becomes a really good area when it's cranking, all this area in here, that's probably like late October, when it's really cranking, and then they make their way all the way up to here, up behind Rangitoto, and this is probably the furthest or the closest they come into land, is this area, and these little areas over here. So then by the time that's in full swing, that's probably about November. That's when it's really cranking. So now it's just starting, but it's starting up north. You will find some little workups around here. There's some workups happening around here at the minute, but they're very sporadic and they're very short-lived. Everybody thinks that the workups are on when they happen right now. You've got to get out. You can catch them. You can get fish in them, but you've got to really work at it. When it's really on, they're going to be in this area here. Under 40 metres. Yeah. Yep. Yep, and around that 40 metre mark, and that's when you get your jitterbugs out, you get your sliders out. It's just the action is just too fast for soft baits. I love using soft baits, but the action can just get too fast for them because you take all day to come down, to get your bait down. So, have we got any more questions? What is the most, what's the most weirdest thing I've got a fish on? Uh, I made a, a squid out of uh, a banana skin once, just to, you know, just to give it some legs, mm -hmm. tuck a hook in it, put a bit of fish oil on it, which helped, and chuck that in and just use that like a jig. Yep. But it's, it's all the illusion. It's all about the illusion. Yep. I got a I got a, a little tuna lure. During the workups last year, I got quite a big tuna lure about this big, and I put a massive big slider head on, the heaviest slider head I could find, a 220, 250 gram and just let that drop down, and boom, every time a snapper. They were just, <laughs> they, when, they're, when they're on, they are on, so they were just smashing it. A uh, couple more, and um, let's have a look. Favourite jet ski spots around Auckland? Anywhere, really, mate. It's uh, There are heaps. So I fish, I leave typically from Beachlands, or Maraitai is where I launch from. Um, I'll fish around the bottom end, I'll fish around uh, Shag, Rock, Gannet, I'll fish out in the Firth, I'll head out towards Channel, um, mostly that area. I don't often go a lot north, but once we get the other side of Christmas, um, up around Martiatia and the Noises and places like that, it's really good fishing. I mean, you just got to go with the flow, really. There's so many. We're, we're lucky being launching where we do, you know, there's so many spots within, within range, easy range. Yes. Where did I catch the sailfish behind me? That one was not caught on a ski, actually. It was caught in Malaysia. It was actually released, but we measured it, and then I got it um, got it moulded over here when I got back. But I caught that in Malaysia. And fishing in Malaysia, it's one place I want to go with a ski, but they don't have any skis in Malaysia, so I was going to have to get one from Singapore, and it was a bit of a nightmare. Um, but fishing for sailfish there is a bit like fishing for kingfish or kahawa. You know, you, you see this work up, and there could be six or seven of these sails swimming around in there. You just get a livey, chuck it in, and mm -hmm. oh, fish on. Uh, Favourite jitterbug in colour? Um, it's a mix. Orange works pretty good, but I've got my biggest ever snapper on um, a blue, a blue one. 22-pound snapper off North Cape on a blue one under a workup. So blue jitterbuggy um, Daiwa Pirate. 
it was. But yeah, beautiful. Really good for, for workups because it gets you down just fast enough through the car white to miss the car white, but fast enough to get to the snapper. That's the key. One of the biggest fish I've caught was about 28 pound and I caught it on a, on a, on a lolly paper. The lolly paper was red on, red on the outside and silver in the middle. I just rolled yep. it up, stuck a sinker with it and, and just jigged that up and down. But it was just a lolly paper. It was just a you know, yeah. little silver When it's on, paper. it's amazing what Absolutely. you can catch fish on. Yeah. Uh, what else we got? How's fishing around Mangawai? I haven't done a lot of fishing around Mangawai, but I have seen some reports lately that the, that's where the fishing, that's where the workups are kicking off. So that's what I, I said in that the start of that report. That's kind of where they start and they make their way down there. A lot of commercial boats in there scooping up the bait at the minute, which is bullshit, but that's what they do. Um, and we just got to deal with it, I guess. Unfortunately, they're allowed to do that. So, uh, so yeah. Do. yeah, I mean, it's one of the three channels to get that bait into the harbour. So if they block one of them, I remember, I remember going along with my boat, and, and the uh, the sounder was telling me it was three feet deep. Yep. And I'm in, you know in forty meters. And it's just solid red the bait. And my opinion of the the Hauraki Gulf is that uh, if it can support sort of like you know like a thousand dolphins, sort of like two or three thousand gannets that are in the various pods around the place, the seabirds, everything else, and they go all year round. The whales is it's very healthy. Yeah, I mean, certainly the signs are that it's healthy. It looks it looks good to me, but, you know, we can never be too complacent and I'm all about fishing for tomorrow. Uh, okay, let's have a look. We'll do maybe two more and then we will sign off. Um, do you have a live bait off your ski? Yeah, I live bait off the ski all the time, Andrew. I have a, a live bait set up on my ski. I set it up quite a few years ago. Uh, to run off the jet unit and I set up a whole little system up there that quite a few people have copied now and I can keep 20 jack mackerel alive all day and that's over over the summer that's the bulk of the fishing I do I'll live bait for snapper and I'll live bait for uh, kingfish and then I'll also soft bait for snapper or kingfish mid-water soft baiting over summer is one of my favorite things to do you'll target them on the sounder and you'll see a show coming up in a couple of weeks when we do that actually target see them on the sounder drop the soft bait down just to that depth and you're getting snapper in 60 meters of water mm. and you're, hatch, you're catching them at 30. Yes, no, they are always on the bottom no I and mean, that's the big thing right people think snapper are always on the bottom they're not mm. they're very rarely on the bottom and especially soft baiting and in, in clear water like we were in today's show those snapper would come up and just smash it mid water on the way down Okay, uh, I think we might, uh, we'll do one more. What's the max range on the ski? About 100 nautical miles is what miles. I can get out. 100 nautical miles I can get out of a 70 litre tank. That's, a, that's 160k. Yep, wow. a long, long way on 70 litres. I've, the, the furthest I've gone was from Matarangi all the way up to the top of Great Barrier. Stayed on the beach the night, just on a little beach, just above the high tide mark. Went fishing around there for the day, back to the beach, packed my tent up, back to Matarangi, still had about three litres of gas. <laughs> so I had, I took 50 litres yeah, of reserve, because yeah. oh, okay. you never know, it was yeah, going yeah. up there, it wasn't even calm, it was 15 knots going up there, 15 plus, blowing over the hills, so I would have used a bit more gas than had it have been calm, but yeah, it was awesome. And so that's that's why I can have confidence in the, in the wave run. I've also been from Beachlands, right out past Horn Rock, to between Horn Rock and the Pigeons on the barrier, Work up fishing and back, uh, and w which would have been you know at least that distance. I didn't measure it, but it was at least that. Do, distance. do people see you out there on your ski? Think you're a bit of a nutcase? So you often get someone saying, like especially when I fish Kuvia, because I fish Kuvia a lot out of Matarangi, and there's always someone will say, "Oh, what are you doing out here? You know, <laughs> what, what are you doing?" And you know, they're, they're typically the days when it's it's five knots, it's over Christmas, when I know there's going to be six or seven other boats at the spot yeah, I'm going yeah, to. Yeah, often. Yeah. I mean, I've been game fishing out of there. And people think, oh, shit, you know, you're going really wide. But often at that time of year, there's more boats out wide than there are in close. Yeah. So it's you've got to factor it all in. Yeah. Uh, but yes, um, Dave, the answer is yes, it is. And uh, I think... So is, is that the bigger... What you've got is the biggest craft available? Uh, it's the biggest... Um, it's a three-seater. 
It's naturally aspirated, which means it's not supercharged, and uh, it's 180 horsepower. So it's it's fully stable. You can stand on it. You can walk around on it. You've got and that heaps engine's of fully fully enclosed. I mean, it's not going to get any water in it. No, unless you roll it. If you if you happen to roll it, but I mean they're designed to be rolled, rolled back over, so and then you... as you're going, it, it self bilges. Sure. So it's, oh, okay. it's all designed. Everything on the ski is designed to get wet. Um, so yeah, that's that. I think. Can we, I just tell you a little story? You certainly can. When I was uh, eight, mm -hmm. we'd go fishing with my grandfather, who would say, "All right, we're going fishing today." So he had this about a fourteen foot. Uh, wooden rowboat and three places to row. He would sit in the back with a, uh, a half G of beer. Right, oh, head that way. So off we go, off we go, off we go. And then he'd write, right, stop. And we pull the oars in. And then he'd lean forward and pick up a, a crate of, of these little, little, well, they were sewing bobbins, what they were. Uh -huh. And he had the pointed of these little sewing bottoms with a bit of lead or, or concrete, I just can't remember which, all tied together with a, uh, a piece of bailing twine. So he's tied them all together so when we get to the spot he picked one out chuck it in the water next one chuck chuck out about 15 pull them all up chuck them all again boom, 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 boom. then pull them all up and then put the what and then he go back to his half g then about 10 minutes later right oh boys put your lines in and, and bang we were catching fish pretty much straight away with the green string that was a little mm -hmm. drop of rigs on the end of it but anyway that's what, I, and then I asked him what was the story with the with the cones, and he said you'll have to think about that. It'll come to you. So I thought about that years later, and what I figured was what he was doing was recreating the gannets hitting the water with those cones, the cone shape, poof, 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 and fish pick up on vibration. Oh, there's the gannets, choo, 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 and they head towards it, and when they get there. <laughs> <laughs> which takes 10 minutes. <laughs> There's some bait there, so oh, where we go. So I, I just, you know, thinking like a fish. That's what it comes down to. Think like a fish. So thank you very much, Bill, oh, absolute for pleasure. coming along. It's yes. been awesome having you here on the couch. Um, so next week, far north again, far north in a harbour, and it is an absolutely manic session. There's not much time in the whole show where the reel is not screaming like your nana. So make sure you tune in. Make sure you watch Jetfish TV. Make sure you go to the Jetfish TV page and like it so you can get all the updates. You can get the reminders of when this is on. And we will see you guys next Thursday, 8 p.m. See you then.